Hi, we're here at Bennington Museum in Bennington, Vermont. I'm Robert Walterstorff, the director, and I'm here with our curator, Jamie Franklin. Welcome. <laughs> Jamie, the show of this show is, the, the, the title of this show is 3D Digital Here and Now. What does that mean exactly? Well, 3D digital, three-dimensional digital technologies, um, a, a lot of acronyms like CAD or Computer Assisted Design, which is various computer programs in which you can actually design objects in three dimensions. And then some of the technologies like CNC, which is computer numeric control, um, which actually you can feed that digital information from a CAD program into a machine, a CNC machine, which can then carve an object in three dimensions based on digital input. So those are kind of a real basic introduction to digital technology. So that's 3D digital. Here and now is the idea that these technologies are being used here in Bennington right now. In the last decade to 15 years, digital technologies have kind of um, taken over the world of manufacturing, both internationally and in our own backyard. And I think the idea was behind this exhibition was that a lot of people here, right here in our own community in Bennington, didn't realize um, that there were companies, um, both large and small, that are using three-dimensional digital technologies to make objects, um, whether they be um, jet engine parts or sculptural objects, um, right here in Bennington. Uh, you know, the story of how this show began is an interesting one, and I want to talk about uh, the Z-Chair by Giovanni Pagnotta, uh, manufactured by, I guess it was called then Vermont, Composites, am I right about that? Mm -hmm. um, and the beginning of the show is that uh, our director of development, Gene Connor, knows, um, knows Jim Sharkey, who's the managing director. I'm not sure what his title is. He, he manages the local, um, the local um, factory for Command Composites. And Command Composites, in an earlier iteration as Vermont Composites, made this chair. Um, and I think that Giovanni, who's, uh, I, I think, an internationally known um, furniture designer reached out to them because they were one of the few firms in the nation that could do this. Is that your... Yeah, yeah. so Kaban Composites um, is an international leader in the manufacture of carbon fiber composite, objects made of carbon fiber. So carbon fiber is this incredible, you'd know it if you saw it, it, it it's a black, dark gray or black fiber um, that has incredible weight to strength ratios, so it's incredibly light, so they use it in things like um, auto um, race cars like a Corvette Fender, which you can see back on the back wall in yellow there, or they use it in um, aeronautics, again, where the same issues of, of weight to strength ratio are really important. Um, but Giovanni, coming from a design background, he was very interested in how he could use this kind of exotic, unique material with these amazing properties to create a beautiful chair, as we see here in the Z chair behind us. So um, because of those strength to weight properties, um, he could make an incredibly elegant, thin design that was perfectly sturdy enough and strong enough to support the weight of somebody sitting in it. But he had to come to Kaman, who had the engineering and scientific expertise to actually materialize his ideas. And there's, as, as I recall from touring the factory, there's an enormous amount of hand craftsmanship involved in Absolutely. carbon composite manufacturing. Also. So, so what they start with is, is a, um, at least traditionally, they start with a flat woven sheet of carbon composite fabric, um, but that's then designed using CAD. And what it does is it, it, the CAD program is an actual design that shows what you cut out of the sheet. So they have these big, long, 20, 30 foot long CNC cutting machines at Kaman Composites. And so Giovanni would design the chair in three dimensions on the computer. He would give them those files. They would cut out those large sheets of carbon composite into the actual, um, kind of, but it's still flimsy like fabric. And then they would um, mold the fabric to the form of a chair that had been, again, designed using digital technologies. But a person has to actually take the fabric, mold it onto this form, and then you have to then, um, it's, a, it's a form that will then completely surround the fabric, and a resin is injected into the, and that's where you create the hard, stiff, supporting, you know, the carbon fiber turns into an actual kind of stiff, three-dimensional object in space. And the three-dimensional enters in two places. It enters at the very beginning. He designs it, um, sorry, the, the, the digital enters in two places. He designs it on a computer screen, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. using digital technology. And it's an elaboration form that would be hard to do without that, to, to extend it into three dimensions. 
Um, and then at the end, I think that it's CNC uh, routers, computer-driven routers that do the final trimming. Um, what's cool about it is that, that um, digital technology is being used to help artists and designers conceive forms that you just couldn't do without digital technology. The airframe chair, which is right behind it, I'm transparent, so it's hard to see on video, probably on the screen. But I think you've told me that that's also, by Johnny Swing, something he just couldn't have conceived without digital technology. Well, he could conceive it, but he couldn't actually physically manufacture it, because the amount of handwork that it would take to create an object like that without a CNC, so, you know, with, with the, the Z chair, you know, it's the ability to cut out these precise forms that mold to the human body. So, Panyana probably, it's a back and forth between the digital and the analog, between between, you know the digital and the material he would design it you know as any designer would or artist would traditionally on a piece of paper but then he translates that design into a digital format and then that digital design gets translated back into a physical format yeah. and then that physical format has to be hand molded onto a, a mold yeah. so it's it's this give and take back and forth where the digital tools are just that they're tools that help to create and realize something that wouldn't have been possible without so one of the things we learned during the show, I think, is, is how deeply embedded digital technology is in the making of three-dimensional objects. And, you know, we tend to think of, of uh, high-tech nowadays. Our minds always jump right away to the world of apps or, or CG and movies, you know, these kind of virtual things. But, in fact, um, digital is becoming deeply embedded in making things. And one of our lessons was you almost can't make anything nowadays, competitively anyway, without using digital technology. It's true. So speaking of the ubiquity um, of digital technologies and, and the manufacturing of objects, um, this wall of coat hangers um, are all objects that were they're manufactured or distributed by the HANCO, which is an acronym from the National Hanger Company, based right here in North Bennington, yeah. Vermont, um, right on Water Street. They're actually based out of the same manufacturing plant that made Cushman furniture here in Bennington in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and when you see it from the outside, it looks like a traditional old school manufacturing plant. Um, but in reality, these plastic injection molded hangers, which um, are in something like 90% of all retail clothing outlets in America, are, are made or distributed by the Hanco, a company based right out of um, North Bennington. They ship millions a year out of that location. You probably, have, you probably have one of these coat hangers in your closet right now as we're speaking. And you don't think about this, but digital technologies were integral to their manufacture. So these injection plastic injection molded coat hangers were designed using CAD programming. So they're designed on a computer, so a three-dimensional form seen in space. Um, you know, they work with some of the top designers in the world, um, and they will often have back and forth conversations about design. Um, and you know, they'll, they'll be sketching things out on a, on a napkin over drinks, and what happens is, a coat hanger has very specific functionality, and so there's only so much you can do in terms of design, and so um, what happens is they, they create these designs in three dimensions, and then they actually create the molds right there on the factory. So they have this big CNC machine where they make these plastic injection molds out of large chunks of steel, and so then from that process, those molds go into a large plastic injection machine, which again is controlled by a computer, um, and it injects melted hot, hot plastic into these molds, and they manufacture millions of these right here in Bennington. And again, it's the idea, these technologies surround us. The objects that we interact with on a daily basis are undoubtedly, we interact with digitally manufactured objects constantly, probably on an hourly basis at the very minimum um, in our everyday activities. Um, I think that we, we defined terms earlier, CNC mean, uh, means computer numeric control. So as Jamie was mentioning, the, um, the, these hangers are injection molded, but they're molded in, um, in molds that have been created using CNC routers. And one, uh, one of the discoveries for us coming in from the outside, Jamie and I are both art historians, so we don't really know much about manufacturing. But, but with the different digital technologies, there are different levels of sort of different numbers that the different technologies work for. And we're, when you're doing plastic injection molding, it makes sense when you're doing thousands or even millions of something. It's very expensive to make a mold, tens of thousands of dollars to make a mold, but then you can make literally millions of things with it. Um, as we'll see elsewhere, you know, if you want to make just a few of something, one or five, you might use some 
3D printing and then plastic milling. Milling of objects is kind of a middle route where you might do anywhere from five to 500. Mm -hmm. So Jamie, if you want to make thousands or even millions of things, the most economical way to do it is to make a mold and then do injection molding. But mold making is very expensive, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to make a mold. This is the very opposite end of the spectrum. This is all, um, these are all objects made by 3D printing. Mm -hmm. So 3D printing, um, there are a lot of different 3D printing technologies. Um, um, a deposition technique, which is the most common, so your average couple hundred dollar printer that you can buy for your home, what it does is it takes various sorts of plastics um, and they come in long, um, like, um, rope-like um, lengths on a, on a roll. Called that, filament. Filament, filament right, exactly, yeah. and it feeds it through a little injection where it's heated till it's melting point. So it's a little bit like a hot glue gun, exactly. but on a bigger, more controlled scale. Exactly, right? so okay. it deposits small little bits of the, the whatever material it's using. It can run from plastic to high-tech examples. You use metallics, they use ceramics. They, and actually, they we have some of those glue. here, metallic mm -hmm. materials. Exactly, yeah. and so, but a 3D printer is fairly slow. At least current technologies um, are fairly slow. So, um, but what they can do is for engineering and manufacturing purposes, they really dramatically um, um, assist with the kind of economies of scale. So, um, and, and with efficiencies in terms of time and cost, as you said, um, a mold traditionally would would take months and months and tens of thousands of dollars to create. Whereas um, James Salerno, who um, was is a young man who originally worked um, at Plasson, um, which was an offshoot of Come On Composites and manufactured carbon composite um, body panels for companies like Corvette, um, one of which is in the exhibition. Um, um, he can now manufacture, he, he works as a consultant for different manufacturing companies. Um, his company is called Hale Mountain Research. Um, and here we actually have a 3D printed mold. So you don't just use 3D printing for finished products. You can actually use them to create molds. So this, this is carbon composite. Exactly. But he's made the mold using 3D printing. Exactly. And, but, but it's the same basic concept where the economies of scale are so great. And, and the same thing, a lot of what you see on here are, are what are known as rapid prototypes. So rapid prototyping is when a, a company like Burton, Burton Snowboards, now an internationally known world leading corporation which began right here in Bennington County in the late 1970s, um, their R&D or research and development for, um, is still based out of Burlington, Vermont. And what they do is they can rapid prototype binding parts. So here's a, 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 a um, what is that? What part is that? <laughs> a strap. <laughs> a, str a, a, a strap for the binding, um, um, a, a heel plate for the binding, helmet parts. And what they can do is they can print this out on a 3D printer. They can put it on the slopes the next day so a snowboarder can go out, use the part, see how it functions in the real world, come back, give the engineers and designers feedback, and literally two days later they can be trying out a new part with slight changes because they don't have to go through the whole process, the expense and time of making new molds or new new elements. They can just digitally make the adjustments on the screen and the computer, 3D print it, which an object like one of these probably doesn't take more than a few hours, maybe, maybe 10 hours for some of the more complex parts, but literally within the next day they can be on, and saving money, time, of course, when it comes to economics and business, these are things that um, people are very much interested in. So in fact, 3D printing is not really used very much for, for creating the, the, the finished product for the end user because it's slow and because I think some of the materials are not as strong as you can injection mold or you can mill. But it's especially useful for rapid prototyping, for testing ideas. Um, I think you were telling me earlier about these three parts, six parts, sorry, um, slightly different sizes. You know, if you wanted to mold those, it would be fantastically expensive. Exactly. Yeah. And so now we have a whole array where we have 98%, 100%, 102%. So you're starting with a company says, I have this thing and I want to I see how I can adjust it slightly, um, take advantage or make it stronger or make it way less. Um, or fit a certain thing. So James at Hale Mountain Research can print off slightly reduced or slightly enlarged versions. Again, the, all six of these variations on the same part, he could probably produce in the course of two days 
have feedback from the company in the course of another couple of days, print them off new prototypes, and the whole cycle of, of business design, research and development, and actual creating of the objects is incredibly exponentially reduced. Now, what, one small uh, market area where you do need unique objects is medical prosthetics because everybody's different. And I find these, these, these are wonderful. Um, also made by James Salerno at Yale Mountain Research. Well, James, what James did is he just printed them off for us to give us an example of what 3D digital printing and technologies can do. We tend to think of these in terms of business, in terms of making money, or on the artistic end of things for tools that allow you to do things you could have never done before. Well, this is an example of an open source software. So you can go on the internet and get the computer file that allows you, if you have a 3D printer, to print this object off. And this is actually how it comes off of the printer bed. All of the individual pieces are printed into one matrix. You then pull it all apart and assemble it, and you have a functioning prosthetic hand. So what's missing is just the elastics here, right? Exactly. So they, they would put the um, um, little elastic bands connecting them back here where there are little holes through here. And so in, in third world countries where they don't have access to medical technologies, this company sends out volunteers with 3D printers. The files are obviously easy to transport. They can go into a community, find an individual with the need for a prosthetic hand, a prosthetic leg. They can take the measurements from that person, adjust the 3D, 3D digital files fairly easily. Um, larger or smaller. Yeah, yeah, larger smaller, adjust it for where it fits onto the body, and print them out in a day, and it costs exponentially less. And they're doing this through, through vol volunteers and the aid of what 3D digital technologies can do. Now, Jamie, so far we've been talking mostly about manufacturing in Bennington. Um, we should talk a little bit about how artists are using 3D digital technology. And this is a good point of transition because it's what I think of as design. And I think of design as kind of being where art meets manufacturing. This is actually student design for a chair um, created by Lee Matheson, who was a student at Bennington College a couple years ago. Um, and um, one thing I love about this, aside from the fact that I just love it as an object, I mean, it's a wonderful object. Um, we worked with John Isherwood, who is, a, um, who is a professor, teacher of sculpture at Bennington College, and we knew that we wanted to have some of his students from his future, sorry, his form to function course included, but that course is offered spring semester, and we knew that none of the students would have a, a, a creation ready to include in the show, which opened in March. Um, so tell me how this chair ended up being here then. So in 2014, John taught this course in the spring, um, and his students were given a, a design kind of parameter. Um, they needed to create a, he didn't, he didn't say make a chair, he said make an object in which it can support your body doing something that it enjoys doing every day. <laughs> um, um, and so um, that was the basic parameter, but then there were further design specs where um, the, the object and the product needed to be manufactured out of a single sheet of plywood, um, and it needed to have um, not, it, it, it needed to be able to come together without external adhesives like screws or nails. Um, and so um, this chair and this pair of interacting stools here behind it um, were both created by students. Um, again, and it's, this, it's a back and forth between the kind of digital and the analog world. A lot of these were prototyped in cardboard. So they're actually physically manipulating the cardboard in real space. They would then take a, a design that they're happy with, translate it into a digital file, and then that digital file um, is used, fed into a CNC laser cutter and router, which then cuts out these individual parts. Again, each chair is able to be cut out of a single sheet of birch veneer plywood. Um, and so they have the files. Um, and so the files were sitting around. Um, John Isher well, occupying literally no space because a file is, you know, on a hard drive. Exactly. So for manufacturing purposes, one of the real expenses in, in large scale manufacturing is storing stock. You know, um, IKEA, you know, has to store thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of any individual piece of furniture that they have to then ship out to their various branches throughout the country. With these new digital technologies, you can basically create an object on demand. So we wanted to include these chairs in this exhibit. 
So they asked the students, they called the students up, actually they probably emailed the students, um, um, and said, can we use your chair design? They said yes. All they had to do was go out and buy a piece of plywood, take the files that they already had on the computer, send the plywood through their CNC laser cutter, you have the parts, and then there's no adhesive involved. This one is actually all self-supporting. There's no adhesive. The only adhesives on this are just hot glue guns in order to tack some of the parts together. Um, but they're very creative designs. This is a fairly standard chair. You know, the, the enjoying television, I think, would be the thing that you enjoy doing. Here it's kind of a dual purpose object where you could either be sitting on the lower stool and eating or working on the upper surface, or you could even have two people sitting, a, a person sitting on the higher stool, a person sitting on the lower stool and interacting, talking. Um, but again, it's, it's a design, it's kind of the interaction between design, digital technologies, analog, putting, working with our hands and materials, and the ability to store these, these digital files, these digital designs, literally, as you said, taking up no space, calling them up whenever you want to use them, and they don't plop out of a printer, but they're fairly straightforward, fairly simple and easy, don't cost a lot of money, and don't take a lot of sophisticated knowledge if you have the tools and the electronic files to make. I think it really is one of the waves of the future. We've talked, to, I think, about a number of themes emerging already. Um, 3D digital design makes you, allows you to create forms, conceive forms, and actually manufacture forms that just weren't possible before. Um, I mean, something that's as simple and mundane as you can email digital files. Um, printing on demand, as it were, 3D printing on demand, but also creating things like this on demand. You know, there are ideas that we're more, um, we're more conversant in, in the publishing world. You know, we've all been exposed to the idea that you can lay out a file and you can email it to your friend in California. It could be printed in California. Um, books are printed on demand. But this, I think, is, one, is the new wave of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Digital. A lot of it's going on here in Bennington. Okay, so, Jamie, are we allowed as director and curator at some point to just say, I love this object? I love this object. And, you know, there are a lot of objects in the show that I think are really great. You know, Giovanni Pagnotta's chair, the Airform chair, um, cool technologies. I mean, this the, the kind of stuff that I had never conceived was going on. Um, this is a sculpture by John Isherwood, who's the sculpture instructor at Bennington College. Remind me the title? Um, the title is Before We Knew before we knew it. it has to do with ideas of origins and things like that. Time is fossil of time. Um, this piece actually originated in a class he was co-teaching with a biology teacher. I didn't know that. Um, and they were, they were talking about interfaces between um, marine biology um, and 3D technologies. Um, and so one of the things that kind of caught John's attention as an artist, you know, we've been talking about the manufacturing and, and the design side of things. Now we're going, how can an artist use these same tools to create unique works of art? Um, and so the idea that John really catched on to is this idea of bilateral symmetry. Um, 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 we as humans are bilaterally symmetric. Symmetrical. You cut us down the middle and we're essentially the same on both sides. Um, well, a lot of sea mammals are also the same. Um, and so um, this is basically kind of inspired by marine biology, marine animal forms. Um, but how he created it, and I love this, this kind of process from idea to um, kind of fabrication to object. Um, he started working with a pastry um, icer. Um, so he, he didn't use actual icing, um, I think that would have been fun too, but he was using like a plaster-like um, material that he would squeeze through a pastry so you get this sort of like star-like form on the end, but what he did is he only created one of these and he said he had to work through like 50 of these in order to get the perfect icing squeeze. Um, and then he, he, he scanned it, he took a 3D digital scanner and he went around this plaster form that he had squeezed out of the icing bag and then he duplicated it, you know, 3D technology. You can do all sorts of things with more yeah, forms. After he's imported the file. Yeah, he, is, he, is, he imports the 3D digital file, which he has gotten from a scanner. You can now get 3D scanners you can get on iPhones these days. Um, I've seen one used once and they're mind-blowing. So he gets all of the three-dimensional information from this um, uh, extruded piece of plaster. He then mirrored it to create a bilateral symmetry. Um, um, and then... Um, started to morph forms, you know, plays with the basic file in order, you know, as an artist does, to try and make it have a certain feel, a certain look. 
Um, and then he selected a very specific type of stone. This is made out of what is known as, um, um, is it Isle Lamotte or Champlain marble. Um, it's actually um, a compressed limestone. I think uh, most geologists wouldn't call it marble, but it's more of a marketing term. But it's limestone that has embedded marine fossils throughout it. So if you're able to take a close look at this, you can see little fossils throughout here. So again, it's drawing on that kind of original inspiration of marine biological forms. Um, but he took that, that big, large, solid chunk of stone and fed it through a CNC lathe, so a computer numeric controlled lathe, where instead of with a traditional wood lathe where it spins really fast and you're physically maneuvering the tool, um, it spins very slowly and that's controlled digitally, but the, the routing or carving blade goes back and forth really fast. So the piece rotates and then the router runs. Yeah, and so every time it makes a run, and each of these lines that you see running through the form, which he actually artistically chose to keep and are actually articulate, so you can see the actual digital processes become a part of the visual aesthetics of the object. It's actually see, sitting here on a pedestal below these two CNC paintings. So these were made by Michael Stradley, who's the digital technologist at Bennington College. And it's this same idea of a CNC. Um, normally you carve or, or manipulate form with a, a CNC router, router. Here they actually slathered on wet paint and he added a paintbrush to the CNC router. So he created code that then, which is basically just the thousands of ones and zeros. You can actually see them in a little <laughs> booklet here in the exhibition. Um, Many pages. A and very it, small type. it creates this almost three-dimensional kind of morphing of space in the paint. Um, and John used that same kind of the, the, the tool marks of the, the CNC machine. And after, you know, he said it took something like 30 or 40 hours for the CNC machine to carve this from a raw block of stone. It then took him a month of work in the studio to meticulously pick and choose which areas he would polish, slightly carve down differently. And again, it's that back and forth using the digital technology as a tool, taking the visual aesthetics that that tool are inherent to that tool, including the CNC lines that are created in the process of manufacture, and then manipulating him to create a final finished sculpture. So the dark polished parts are done by hand, I think. Yeah, so he would, that's, that would have, this would have been covered with these lines, and he chose to eliminate them in certain elements, which then, of course, helps to emphasize that. Sure, yeah, through the contrast. And I, I had stared at it a while before it dawned on me that it's rigorously symmetrical. You pointed out that, that the two halves are, are you know, mere images of each other, but the lines are the same in each place, and they're little points. A router, of course, has a spin bit, and there are little places where the router hesitates and leaves a, leaves a round mark. And you look at it, and, and there is this sense of kind of primitive and animalistic. You know, you have the sense that their eyes looking at you. You know, I find there's lots of lots of illusions in this um, primordial times. It seems to refer to Inuit sculpture, uh, Pacific sculpture. Um, I love it. Um, one of the other things I love about it is, is that he's used the accidents of extruding plaster. You know, you get this this oozy, oodly stuff, and you can scan it by scanning and making a 3D scan. You can import the accidents of nature into um, into an art object, and we see another a, a couple more objects here which use the same sort of idea. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking about how uh, how digital technology allows artists, I suppose manufacturers too, but in particular artists to import the accidents of nature. Um, and this is especially through 3D digital scanning. You know, you could go and scan bark and import and, and import the accidents of bark shapes into into work. Um, John Isherwood extrudes plaster, and he does scans of that. Um, this is um, a student at Bennington College, Harlan Steed, and he imported the um, the the data from a topographical map, um, topographical maps of the Bennington area. Um, and he made a sort of wall treatment. I think of this as a three-dimensional wallpaper. You know, it connects, uh, bottom connects to top and, and side connects to side. So you could completely cover walls with this, a three-dimensional wallpaper. Um, it's a, an amazing idea to think of being in a room covered with that. Um, would be really wild, I think. <laughs> um, but still, you can import the, the accidents of nature, topography, into art making. I think one of the other really cool things about this, and. I think you, I've actually gotten this idea from you, so you can kind of expand on it and maybe articulate it a little bit more clearly. It's the, you can endlessly reproduce unique items. 
So this is made up from individual panels that can be combined together infinitely, but each panel could be orientated slightly differently. So you could panel this entire wall and kind of artistically arrange the panels so that they relate to each other in new ways and create new forms. Somebody could then take the same basic form, tile another wall exactly the same size, and it would be a completely different wall. And so it's this, I don't know how to articulate it perfectly. It's like, it's like infinitely reproducible, unique items. Or you see, I, I've coined the term of mass producing unique items. So, yeah. you, you know, one of the examples then is, is you could have a, an architectural facade that's covered with a wave shape. So every panel on it is different because all together they make the wave shape, but every panel is different. Um, but you make one, um, one digital file for the whole facade and then you break that into, let's say, a thousand panels and then each of them can have a, you know, a code that generates one. And as long as you have a machine that can make it, a CNC router or some sort of machine that can stamp them, you can make a thousand different panels, but affordably. So mass producing unique items. You know, it's mind-blowing what, what the digital realm is going to bring to making. It's, it's the ability for instant, instant and kind of unlimited customization. So um, Harlan was actually a student in a class taught by Carolina Caviaca. Um, Carolina is a professor of design and art at Dartmouth College. She was guest teaching at Bennington College um, last year. And this is actually a sink that she designed and made. It's a sink that she actually pulled out of her own bathroom to loan it to us here um, at the Bennington Museum for this exhibition. Um, she calls it Land Where I Was Born. And so it's a sink that has been CNC rooted out of a block of laminated Vermont maple. She was born in... Um, um, I always forget the name of her, her town, Westminster West, which yeah. is over on the east side of the mountains. Um, and she says there's lots of marshy beaver ponds in this area, and this is where she was born. So it's a very personal. Um, she again, she took topographic maps. I'm sure Harlan learned that technique from Carolina. Um, and then she um, manipulated the forms using CAD. Um, to create the steep sides that you require for a so sink. So she stretched it in this dimension. Exactly, so, it she so that you would have a deep bowl-like space. But the actual topography relates very personally to her and her place in the world. But it's a one-of-a-kind object that could be reproduced, but it could also be reproduced for somebody else. Yeah. Because I have a suspicion, I never actually asked her this question, I think she probably pulled the 3D topographical map off of a US ge geological survey online. I don't know that for a fact, but I've sort of guessed the same thing. So again, you could go to your place of birth in a topological map. Of course, you'd need dips like this, or maybe if you lived in a mountain area, you could reverse the topography. If you lived in Nebraska, it would not be a... It would be a very shallow yeah. sink. <laughs> um, but it is this idea of kind of infinite um, 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 customization and making objects that relate personally to you and being able to do that um, fairly easily with the aid of digital technologies. And I'm eternally grateful to her that she pulled this thing out of her house to lend to the exhibition. Thank you, Carolina. So for me, I think one of the really great things about digital technologies, and, and, and we've mentioned this again and again, but it's the idea that these are tools that allow artists to pursue ideas that they maybe could never have pursued before, create objects that they could have never created before. Um, so we're standing in front of um, three 3D printed masks, part of a, a larger project called Stranger Visions by Heather Hagborn Dewey. Uh, Heather Dewey Hagborn. Dewey Hagborn, excuse me. Um, and she is an alum of Bennington College. Um, and when she was going to Bennington, um, she always wanted to try and find a way to mesh her interest in science and the arts. Um, and she continued, has continued to do that since she graduated. Uh, and this project was born out of um, a moment where she was sitting in a, um, her therapist's office. She was sitting in her shrink's couch and she saw a Impressionist painting or a print of an Impressionist painting hanging on the wall in the background. And there was a crack in the glass and in that crack, there was a single strand of hair, and this caught her attention. And she started to think, what can I know about the person whose hair that came, who, the person that that hair came from? And that started her down this journey of exploring DNA sequencing and the information that you can extract from DNA. So what she's done is she's gone out into New York City. She lived in New York City at the time that she was making this project. 
and she started collecting what she referred to as um, DNA detritus. So um, you may not realize it, you don't think about it, it's probably something you don't want to think too much about, but we're always sloughing off DNA, yeah. which are bits and pieces of ourselves. And through science, you can extract information out of a piece of hair, a toenail, a fingernail, a piece of saliva on gum, or a cigarette that you smoked. Um, and so she's gone around collecting these little bits and pieces of DNA detritus, and then you can take those, you can extract the DNA out of them. And DNA is essentially analogous to digital code. Um, it is a system of um, numbers, letters, not literally, but they can be translated to that. Yeah. Um, and so but it's just a code, a sequential code. A exactly. sequential code where each layer mean, gives you information about a different physical attribute. So it can tell you that it is a, a Caucasian female, an African American male. But then Heather, at least with the current kind of abilities of technology, she has to extrapolate every bit of information. What does, what does the overall facial profile of an African American male look like? And it gets into issues of, of, of racial and genetic profiling, um, questioning what she as an artist um, is interpreting. And again, all digital information has to be created by someone somewhere out there. And so I love this project because she takes that DNA information, creates a 3D digital model of the human face from that DNA on a computer, and then she 3D prints these masks, which have this real physical, kind of eerie, surreal presence. They really do. There's <laughs> this wonderful matte quality to the surface, and, and the colors are so subtle, and I think I, I know from you, the colors are actually part of the 3D print. They're not applied later. Yeah, so this is not a deposition. This is a centered laser um, printing process. So a laser is projected into a bed of powdered pigmented nylon, okay. and the laser is pointed at a particular area, and it fuses the, the nylon together, and so these prints come out of the printer bed looking as you see them. You have to dust off yeah. some of the loose powder, but yeah. essentially, this isn't hand-painted. This is actually a three-dimensional object that's printed and comes off of the printer bed as you see it. Well, so they're, to me, a little bit creepy, you know, because they're both lifelike and not alive. But the whole concept is also disturbing, and I think that's part of the point. Um, well, that's what I, again, that's what I love about, about these works in particular, but about the larger ideas of this exhibit is that, you know, these are tools, these are digital technologies. They're not, you know, we tend to think that digital technologies have minds of their own and they, they kind of, you push a button and this happens or you push this. Well, somebody had to program that button to do what you want it to do and you push it. And, and Heather is taking that kind of basic premises, kind of taking it all the way back down to its most elemental human core of DNA and then extrapolating back into the digital realm. And I love how artists are able to think about these new technologies that we just as a human race, even though we're surrounded by them, we're still just starting to sort through the implications that these have in our everyday lives. The idea of genetic surveillance, you know, can the government go out and, and find out where we've been or, or what we look at like based on the information that we leave behind unintentionally. These are all these kind of, kind of underlying sub-layers of meaning that Heather is interested in kind of bringing to the surface through a project like this. So they're objects with an incredible physicality, but there's a, a, a real conceptuality to these as well, and they get into these big titanic issues of the modern world about code, um, digital information, and privacy. Exactly. And so, you know, We've just touched on kind of the tip of the iceberg in this exhibition. I, I, I mean, we, we just talked about some pretty large yeah. <laughs> um, universal issues, um, but we've only worked with objects in one gallery. This exhibition is actually fills two galleries, and we've only selected a couple of the objects on view, so we really want to encourage you to come back and come back often. The exhibition is up through June 15th. June 15th. Yeah. And we have a, a, a new offer that we want to assign, that we want to announce. If you're, because we think it's so important, this exhibition to Bennington, to Bennington's self-conception, uh, to Bennington's uh, sense of what it does and, and how it changes the world. 
Um, every object here is either made in Bennington or is created by a student who's been through Bennington. Um, one of the bigger themes of the exhibition is that Bennington is changing the world and doing very sophisticated work here that goes out into the world, goes across the globe, and even conceivably goes up to Mars with the, the design for Mars housing. We think that it's, it's so important for Benningtonians to see this for their, se for their sense of self that we invite all of them to come in here for free for the last month of the exhibition. Um, of course, there are people who don't live in Bennington County who work in one of these firms. So the offer is very simple. If you live or work in the entire Bennington County, come in free until the show closes June 15th.